you need a good library. Shuf got me started on my library. Here's one of the books he recommended. Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Think and Grow Rich. Shuf said to me, doesn't that book title intrigue you? Think and Grow Rich. Don't you have to read that book? Think and Grow Rich. I said, yes, sir, by Napoleon Hill. I went and found that book in a used bookstore. That's where I had to start. In a used bookstore. I paid less than 50 cents for it. I've still got it. It's one of the rare hardback covers. Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Chapter 14. The Sixth Sense. The Door to the Temple of Wisdom. The Thirteenth Step Toward Riches. The thirteenth principle is known as the sixth sense, through which infinite intelligence may and will communicate voluntarily without any effort from or demands by the individual. This principle is the apex of the philosophy. It can be assimilated, understood, and applied only by first mastering the other twelve principles. The sixth sense is that portion of the subconscious mind which has been referred to as the creative imagination. It has also been referred to as the receiving set through which ideas, plans, and thoughts flash into the mind. The flashes are sometimes called hunches or inspirations. The sixth sense defies description. It cannot be described to a person who has not mastered the other principles of this philosophy because such a person has no knowledge and no experience with which the sixth sense may be compared. Understanding of the sixth sense comes only by meditation through mind development from within. The sixth sense probably is the medium of contact between the finite mind of man and infinite intelligence, and for this reason it is a mixture of both the mental and the spiritual. It is believed to be the point at which the mind of man contacts the universal mind. After you have mastered the principles described in this book, you will be prepared to accept as truth a statement which may, otherwise, be incredible to you, namely, through the aid of the sixth sense, you will be warned of impending dangers in time to avoid them, and notified of opportunities in time to embrace them. There comes to your aid, and to do your bidding, with the development of the sixth sense, a guardian angel, who will open to you at all times the door to the temple of wisdom. Whether or not this is a statement of truth, you will never know except by following the instructions described in the pages of this book or some similar method of procedure. The author is not a believer in nor an advocate of miracles for the reason that he has enough knowledge of nature to understand that nature never deviates from her established laws. Some of her laws are so incomprehensible that they produce what appear to be miracles. The sixth sense comes as near to being a miracle as anything I have ever experienced, and it appears so only because I do not understand the method by which this principle is operated. This much the author does know, that there is a power or a first cause or an intelligence which permeates every atom of matter and embraces every unit of energy perceptible to man, that this infinite intelligence converts acorns into oak trees, causes water to flow downhill in response to the law of gravity, follows night with day and winter with summer, each maintaining its proper place in relationship to the other. This intelligence may, through the principles of this philosophy, be induced to aid in transmuting desires into concrete or material form. The author has this knowledge because he has experimented with it and has experienced it. Step by step, through the preceding chapters, you have been led to this, the last principle. If you have mastered each of the preceding principles, you are now prepared to accept, without being skeptical, the stupendous claims made here. If you have not mastered the other principles, you must do so before you may determine definitely whether or not the claims made in this chapter are fact or fiction. While I was passing through the age of hero worship, I found myself trying to imitate those whom I most admired. Moreover, I discovered that the element of faith with which I endeavored to imitate my idols gave me great capacity to do so quite successfully. I have never entirely divested myself of this habit of hero worship, although I have passed the age commonly given over to such. My experience has taught me that the next best thing to being truly great is to emulate the great by feeling and action as nearly as possible. 
Long before I had ever written a line for publication or endeavored to deliver a speech in public, I followed the habit of reshaping my own character by trying to imitate the nine men whose lives and life works had been most impressive to me. These nine men were Emerson, Paine, Edison, Darwin, Lincoln, Burbank, Napoleon, Ford, and Carnegie. Every night over a long period of years I held an imaginary council meeting with this group whom I called my invisible counselors. The procedure was this. Just before going to sleep at night, I would shut my eyes and see in my imagination this group of men seated with me around my council table. Here I had not only an opportunity to sit among those whom I considered to be great, but I actually dominated the group by serving as the chairman. I had a very definite purpose in indulging my imagination through these nightly meetings. My purpose was to rebuild my own character so it would represent a composite of the characters of my imaginary counselors. Realizing, as I did early in life, that I had to overcome the handicap of birth in an environment of ignorance and superstition, I deliberately assigned myself the task of voluntary rebirth through the method here described. Building Character Through Autosuggestion being an earnest student of psychology, I knew, of course, that all men have become what they are because of their dominating thoughts and desires. I knew that every deeply seated desire has the effect of causing one to seek outward expression through which that desire may be transmuted into reality. I knew that self-suggestion is a powerful factor in building character, that it is, in fact, the sole principle through which character is built. With this knowledge of the principles of mind operation, I was fairly well armed with the equipment needed in rebuilding my character. In these imaginary council meetings, I called on my cabinet members for the knowledge I wished each to contribute, addressing myself to each member in audible words as follows. Mr. Emerson, I desire to acquire from you the marvelous understanding of nature which distinguished your life. I ask that you make an impress upon my subconscious mind of whatever qualities you possessed which enabled you to understand and adapt yourself to the laws of nature. I ask that you assist me in reaching and drawing upon whatever sources of knowledge are available to this end. Mr. Burbank, I request that you pass on to me the knowledge which enabled you to so harmonize the laws of nature that you cause the cactus to shed its thorns and become an edible food. Give me access to the knowledge which enabled you to make two blades of grass grow where but one grew before, and helped you to blend the coloring of the flowers with more splendor and harmony, for you alone have successfully gilded the lily. Napoleon, I desire to acquire from you, by emulation, the marvelous ability you possess to inspire men and to arouse them to greater and more determined spirit of action also to acquire the spirit of enduring faith, which enabled you to turn defeat into victory and to surmount staggering obstacles. Emperor of fate, king of chance, man of destiny, I salute you. Mr. Payne, I desire to acquire from you the freedom of thought and the courage and clarity with which to express convictions which so distinguished you. Mr. Darwin, I wish to acquire from you the marvelous patience and ability to study cause and effect without bias or prejudice, so exemplified by you in the field of natural science. Mr. Lincoln, I desire to build in my own character the keen sense of justice, the untiring spirit of patience, the sense of humor, the human understanding, and the tolerance which were your distinguishing characteristics. Mr. Carnegie, I am already indebted to you for my choice of life work, which has brought me great happiness and peace of mind. I wish to acquire a thorough understanding of the principles of organized effort, which you used so effectively in the building of a great industrial enterprise. Mr. Ford, you have been among the most helpful of the men who have supplied much of the material essential to my work. I wish to acquire your spirit of persistence, the determination, poise, and self-confidence which have enabled you to master poverty, organize, unify, and simplify human effort, so I may help others to follow in your footsteps. Mr. Edison, I have seated you nearest to me at my right because of the personal cooperation you have given me during my research into the causes of success and failure. I wish to acquire from you the marvelous spirit of faith, 
with which you have uncovered so many of nature's secrets, the spirit of unremitting toil with which you have so often wrested victory from defeat. My method of addressing the members of the imaginary cabinet would vary according to the traits of character in which I was, for the moment, most interested in acquiring. I studied the records of their lives with painstaking care. After some months of this nightly procedure, I was astounded by the discovery that these imaginary figures became apparently real. Each of these nine men developed individual characteristics which surprised me. For example, Lincoln developed the habit of always being late, then walking around in solemn parade. When he came, he walked very slowly with his hands clasped behind him, and once in a while he would stop as he passed and rest his hand momentarily upon my shoulder. He always wore an expression of seriousness upon his face. Rarely did I see him smile. The cares of a sundered nation made him grave. That was not true of the others. Burbank and Payne often indulged in witty repartee, which seemed at times to shock the other members of the cabinet. One night Payne suggested that I prepare a lecture on the age of reason and deliver it from the pulpit of a church which I formally attended. Many around the table laughed heartily at the suggestion. Not Napoleon. He drew his mouth down at the corners and groaned so loudly that all turned and looked at him with amazement. To him the church was but a pawn of the state, not to be reformed, but to be used as a convenient inciter to mass activity by the people. On one occasion Burbank was late. When he came he was excited with enthusiasm and explained that he had been late because of an experiment he was making through which he hoped to be able to grow apples on any sort of tree. Payne chided him by reminding him that it was an apple which started all the trouble between man and woman. Darwin chuckled heartily as he suggested that Payne should watch out for little serpents when he went into the forest to gather apples, as they had the habit of growing into big snakes. Emerson observed, No serpents, no apples, and Napoleon remarked, No apples, no state. Lincoln developed the habit of always being the last one to leave the table after each meeting. On one occasion, he leaned across the end of the table, his arms folded, and remained in that position for many minutes. I made no attempt to disturb him. Finally, he lifted his head slowly, got up and walked to the door, then turned around, came back, and laid his hand on my shoulder and said, My boy, you will need much courage if you remain steadfast in carrying out your purpose in life. But remember... When difficulties overtake you, the common people have common sense. Adversity will develop it. One evening Edison arrived ahead of all the others. He walked over and seated himself at my left, where Emerson was accustomed to sit, and said, You are destined to witness the discovery of the secret of life. When the time comes, you will observe that life consists of great swarms of energy or entities, each as intelligent as human beings think themselves to be. These units of life group together like hives of bees and remain together until they disintegrate through lack of harmony. These units have differences of opinion, the same as human beings, and often fight among themselves. These meetings which you are conducting will be very helpful to you. They will bring to your rescue some of the same units of life which serve the members of your cabinet during their lives. These units are eternal. They never die. Your own thoughts and desires serve as the magnet which attracts units of life from the great ocean of life out there. Only the friendly units are attracted, the ones which harmonize with the nature of your desires. The other members of the cabinet began to enter the room. Edison got up and slowly walked around to his own seat. Edison was still living when this happened. It impressed me so greatly that I went to see him and told him about the experience. He smiled broadly and said, your dream was more a reality than you may imagine it to have been. He added no further explanation to his statement. These meetings became so realistic that I became fearful of their consequences and discontinued them for several months. The experiences were so uncanny, I was afraid if I continued them I would lose sight of the fact that the meetings were purely experiences of my imagination. Some six months after I had discontinued the practice, I was awakened one night, or thought I was, when I saw Lincoln standing at my bedside. He said, The world will soon need your services. 
It is about to undergo a period of chaos which will cause men and women to lose faith and become panic-stricken. Go ahead with your work and complete your philosophy. That is your mission in life. If you neglect it for any cause whatsoever, you will be reduced to a primal state and be compelled to retrace the cycles through which you have passed during thousands of years. I was unable to tell the following morning whether I had dreamed this or had actually been awake, and I have never since found out which it was. But I do know that the dream, if it were a dream, was so vivid in my mind the next day that I resumed my meetings the following night. At our next meeting the members of my cabinet all filed into the room together and stood at their accustomed places at the council table, while Lincoln raised a glass and said, Gentlemen, let us drink a toast to a friend who has returned to the fold. After that I began to add new members to my cabinet, until now it consists of more than fifty, among them Christ, St. Paul, Galileo, Copernicus, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, Homer, Voltaire, Bruno, Spinoza, Drummond, Kant, Schopenhauer, Newton, Confucius, Albert Hubbard, Braun Ingersoll, Wilson, and William James. This is the first time that I have had the courage to mention this. Heretofore, I have remained quiet on the subject because I knew from my own attitude in connection with such matters that I would be misunderstood if I described my unusual experience. I have been emboldened now to reduce my experience to the printed page because I am now less concerned about what they say than I was in the years that have passed. One of the blessings of maturity is that it sometimes brings one greater courage to be truthful, regardless of what those who do not understand may think or say. Lest I be misunderstood, I wish here to state most emphatically that I still regard my cabinet meetings as being purely imaginary, but I feel entitled to suggest that, while the members of my cabinet may be purely fictional and the meetings existent only in my own imagination, they have led me into glorious paths of adventure, rekindled an appreciation of true greatness, encouraged creative endeavor, and emboldened the expression of honest thought. Somewhere in the cell structure of the brain is located an organ which receives vibrations of thought ordinarily called hunches. So far, science has not discovered where this organ of the sixth sense is located, but this is not important. The fact remains that human beings do receive accurate knowledge through sources other than the physical senses. Such knowledge generally is received when the mind is under the influence of extraordinary stimulation. Any emergency which arouses the emotions and causes the heart to beat more rapidly than normal may, and generally does, bring the sixth sense into action. Anyone who has experienced a near accident while driving knows that on such occasions the sixth sense often comes to one's rescue and aids by split seconds in avoiding the accident. These facts are mentioned preliminary to a statement of fact which I shall now make, namely, that during my meetings with the invisible counselors, I find my mind most receptive to ideas, thoughts, and knowledge which reach me through the sixth sense. I can truthfully say that I owe entirely to my invisible counselors full credit for such ideas, facts, or knowledge as I receive through inspiration. On scores of occasions when I have faced emergencies, some of them so grave that my life was in jeopardy, I have been miraculously guided past these difficulties through the influence of my invisible counselors. My original purpose in conducting council meetings with imaginary beings was solely that of impressing my own subconscious mind through the principle of auto-suggestion with certain characteristics which I desired to acquire. In more recent years, my experimentation has taken on an entirely different trend. I now go to my imaginary counselors with every difficult problem which confronts me and my clients. The results are often astonishing, although I do not depend entirely on this form of counsel. You, of course, have recognized that this chapter covers a subject with which a majority of people are not familiar. The sixth sense is a subject that will be of great interest and benefit to the person whose aim is to accumulate vast wealth but it need not claim the attention of those whose desires are more modest. 
Henry Ford undoubtedly understands and makes practical use of the sixth sense. His vast business and financial operations make it necessary for him to understand and use this principle. The late Thomas A. Edison understood and used the sixth sense in connection with the development of inventions, especially those involving basic patents in connection with which he had no human experience and no accumulated knowledge to guide him, as was the case while he was working on the talking machine and the moving picture machine. Nearly all great leaders, such as Napoleon, Bismarck, Joan of Arc, Christ, Buddha, Confucius, and Muhammad, understood and probably made use of the sixth sense almost continuously. The major portion of their greatness consisted of their knowledge of this principle. The sixth sense is not something that one can take off and put on at will. Ability to use this great power comes slowly through application of the other principles outlined in this book. Seldom does any individual come into workable knowledge of the sixth sense before the age of forty. More often the knowledge is not available until one is well past fifty, and this for the reason that the spiritual forces with which the sixth sense is so closely related do not mature and become usable except through years of meditation, self-examination, and serious thought. No matter who you are or what may have been your purpose in reading this book, you can profit by it without understanding the principle described in this chapter. This is especially true if your major purpose is that of accumulation of money or other material things. The chapter on the sixth sense was included because the book is designed for the purpose of presenting a complete philosophy by which individuals may unerringly guide themselves in attaining whatever they ask of life. The starting point of all achievement is desire. The finishing point is that brand of knowledge which leads to understanding, understanding of self, understanding of others, understanding of the laws of nature, recognition, and understanding of happiness. This sort of understanding comes in its fullness only through familiarity with and use of the principle of the sixth sense. Hence that principle had to be included as part of this philosophy for the benefit of those who demand more than money. Having read the chapter, you must have observed that while reading it, you were lifted to a high level of mental stimulation, splendid, Come back to this again a month from now, read it once more, and observe that your mind will soar to a still higher level of stimulation. Repeat this experience from time to time, giving no concern as to how much or how little you learn at the time, and eventually you will find yourself in possession of a power that will enable you to throw off discouragement, master fear, overcome procrastination, and draw freely upon your imagination. Then you will have felt the touch of that unknown something which has been the moving spirit of every truly great thinker, leader, artist, musician, writer, statesman. Then you will be in position to transmute your desires into their physical or financial counterpart as easily as you may lie down and quit at the first sign of opposition. Faith versus Fear Previous chapters have described how to develop faith through auto-suggestion, desire, and the subconscious. The next chapter presents detailed instructions for the mastery of fear. Here will be found a full description of the six fears which are the cause of all discouragement, timidity, procrastination, indifference, indecision, and the lack of ambition, self-reliance, initiative, self-control, and enthusiasm. Search yourself carefully as you study these six enemies, as they may exist only in your subconscious mind, where their presence will be hard to detect. Remember, too, as you analyze the six ghosts of fear, that they are nothing but ghosts because they exist only in one's mind. Remember also that ghosts, creations of uncontrolled imagination, have caused most of the damage people have done to their own minds. Therefore, the ghosts can be as dangerous as if they lived and walked on the earth in physical bodies. The ghost of fear of poverty, which seized the minds of millions of people in 1929, was so real that it caused the worst business depression this country has ever known. Moreover, this particular ghost still frightens some of us out of our wits.